Persona 4 has always been a game that I've had a complicated relationship with. Anyone who has looked at my channel for more than two seconds knows that I kinda like the Persona series. You know, just a little bit. I first played this game in early 2018 during the initial craze for Persona 5, and sometime after beating Persona 3 in late 2017. This wouldn't actually be my first encounter with Persona 4, however. My first glimpse at anything Persona 4 related actually came from a name drop reference to Chie in the anime No Game No Life. That didn't really make me want to play the game though because they didn't really say anything about it. I wouldn't play the game until years later during the heyday of Persona 5. For the past few years, basically, I've been retroactively going back and experiencing old media from the 2000s or earlier. Stuff that I was either too young for at the time because Rated M for Mature or stuff that I just missed out during that time of my childhood. So naturally, given how popular Persona 4 was during those times, I was interested to see what this icon of otaku culture had to offer. A series of murders with unidentifiable causes start occurring in the town of Inaba. All the while, a rumor starts spreading about a mysterious channel that comes on at midnight when you stare at the TV on a rainy night. The victims of the murders just happen to appear there before dying. You also discover that there's a whole world inside that television. But it's not a very safe world. It's filled with monsters called shadows. You and your friends come to the conclusion that someone must be intentionally throwing the murder victims into that world, where they eventually are killed by the shadows and turn up dead back in the real world afterwards. You and your new companions decide to take it upon themselves to use this knowledge to predict when the next attack will occur and try to stop the culprit. And the rest is history. So I really wasn't sure how the hell I was even going to go about writing this video without coming off like I'm bipolar or something. My solution? To completely separate my mixed feelings for this game. One section where I channel my hater energy, and the other where I really show some well-deserved love for the game. Now, I understand that trying to do that will be like taking the yeast out of bread, but I felt like shaking things up a bit would make the video more interesting. I've been looking to try new things to prevent my videos from feeling too formulaic and stale. I will be providing timestamps for my very different perspectives on this game, and at the end of each of them, I will provide another timestamp to the other perspectives and the conclusion. This way, no matter how you watch the video, you will have a complete experience. Sort of. Without further delay, let's take a dive into my psyche and see where exactly this game stands in my head. Will you see it through in its entirety? Or will you settle for what you want to hear? There will be no judgement on my part. I totally understand if you don't want to hear me shred on your favorite game for the better part of a half hour or so. Or maybe you're someone who only wants to hear that. The choice is entirely yours. In this game, you play as the new kid who just rolled into town. As soon as he arrives, some strange things start happening around town, and you discover a supernatural phenomenon that happens at midnight. Oh, whoops. That's the wrong synopsis, but you probably couldn't tell the difference, right? Jokes aside though, that is more or less the setup for the story. Where it starts to deviate is where I'll actually start. Persona 4's story takes on the form of a murder mystery. Rather than taking on a grand scale of saving the world from dark entities, it focuses on a localized murder case. While the premise sounds interesting, the actual mystery progression is barely existent. Straight from the get-go, the group immediately tries to start finding connections between the victims to possibly bring them closer to the culprit's motives. 
Okay, that's an actually logical first step. It takes them until after the second dungeon to figure out the one common factor between all the victims. Meanwhile, you, the player, have probably already figured this out either before or after the first dungeon. This is a trend that continues throughout three quarters of the game. In a mystery story, the audience is supposed to figure things out alongside the characters as they gather clues and facts. In Persona 4, the player is always way ahead of the gang most of the time. The one connection between all the victims is that they all appear on the news and garner attention of the public before later appearing on the Midnight Channel and then going missing, presumably thrown into the TV world. This is the only real clue you have to work with until about halfway through the game. This is the part where the story throws a red herring at you. A creepy incel kid, Mitsuo, commits a copycat murder. The murder doesn't line up with the circumstances of the other victims, as the victim that time, your homeroom teacher, Moroka, never appeared on TV or the Midnight Channel. The group comes to the conclusion that Mitsuo is the culprit and he must have stopped using the TV world to kill people because they thwarted the last several attempts. Come on guys, it has to be him! Look at how creepy he is, right? But obviously no, it's not that simple. He was just an attention whore. The kid detective Naoto allows herself to get kidnapped to prove that the culprit is still out there. So once again, you're left with only the same clue you've been sticking with for the entire story. You spend most of the mystery at square one. This brings me to my next point, the pacing. Now, to make myself clear, I don't think having a slow-paced plot is necessarily a bad thing. You can have a slow-paced plot and still have it be good. The issue with Persona 4's story isn't necessarily the pacing, but rather what they occupy the time between plot points with. Without spoiling anything too specific for Persona 3... Whoa, 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 really dude? The Persona 3 comparison? Isn't that kind of overdone? Well, the answer is yes, absolutely, 100%. And that's exactly what I'm going to be doing right now. So I notice that very often people will talk down on other games in the series to prop up another. When it comes to Persona 4 in particular, the Persona 3 comparison is extremely common. But given how similar these two games are, I suppose it's only natural. While praise for Persona 4's own strengths does exist, a lot of it ends up at the expense of Persona 3 in my experience. When most of what you have to say about a game amounts to it's better than these other games rather than praising it on its own merits, that really isn't saying much of anything. Something that still kinda confuses me is that despite all the comparisons to Persona 3, all of the criticisms that people had about 3 don't seem to carry over to 4, even while the things they criticized are very much still there. People seem so hyper fixated on the couple changes they really like, particularly the addition of all party members being social links, the direction of the dungeon aesthetics, and a direct commands option for your characters in battle. If these were the only things you were hung up on, that is perfectly fine. I'm not trying to bag on anyone for that. But when people vehemently complain about issues like pacing, repetitiveness, and balancing in one game, those things suddenly just stop mattering when they carry over to the other. If you don't like it here, but you're suddenly fine with it here, maybe those things weren't that big of an issue to begin with. I understand that the comparison is necessary, I just think people lean into it a bit too much. Now that raises the question, am I really any better? No, I am not. I feel like being a little mean today. If people can talk down on Persona 3 to prop up 4, then the same can be done with the opposite. So that's my little rant about comparing the games. Anyway, back to my point. Pacing. A story can be slow paced and still be good. The issue with Persona 4 in particular is that the story is very backloaded. Without spoiling anything too specific for Persona 3, in that game, while plot points are spread out every month in-game, the game always at least gives you some character exchanges here and there leading up to the next plot point. While these don't advance the plot as directly as some people may have wanted, it took the time to develop the characters, and their attitudes in later plot points would reflect their change. It was nice to actually see a character's newfound resolve come up later in the face of changing circumstances, 
Persona 4 occupies most of its runtime with slice of life shenanigans. It's not even so much that I have anything against slice of life. Hell, I enjoy a good slice of life anime from time to time. But there's no rule saying you have to choose between that and story or character development. Persona 3 would even use vacations and trips to facilitate certain plot points. Compare that to something like Persona 4's camping trip, it seems like they're trying to establish how unanimously hated Mr. Moroka is before the occurrence of his death, except the game already makes that clear within the first few minutes upon the protagonist arriving at school. In fact, even during story events, they spend a lot of time relaying information that we already know, or just coming to a dead end. Literally, every time you save someone in the TV world, you wait like half a month for them to recover, then ask them, Yo, do you remember anything from when you were kidnapped? No. Damn. You guys want to take a trip to Bangladesh or some? Repeat this every month until around November-ish. It's actually kind of funny, people will say Persona 3 doesn't get interesting until very late game, when I'd argue that is far more the case in Persona 4. Hell, if you line up all the key moments between Persona 3 and 4 side by side, the pacing is almost one to one. Bruh, there are people out there who will actually try to argue that the filler moments in Persona 4 actually improve the pacing. Speaking of patching a bullet wound with a band-aid, there's the dungeons. The dungeons are still randomly generated, but I never found that to be horribly offensive. Just mediocre. However, I have a pretty unpopular opinion when it comes to these dungeons. I can't be the only one who thought this when playing the game for the first time. The dungeon crawling somehow feels even more hollow than Persona 3's, and Persona 4 seems to try to compensate this by making the floors bigger. Like, I get the feeling that I'm supposed to be enjoying this more, but I don't. It's almost as if making empty dungeons bigger doesn't make them any less empty. While the number of floors you have to go through is still less than Tartarus, they ended up feeling more exhausting to get through for me personally. You're under a lot more pressure to finish a TV dungeon, while in Persona 3, there was no set deadline. You were only ever forced to go once, very early in the game. Pacing out the rest is entirely up to you. Sections of Tartarus were always conveniently spread out, and checkpoints were always right before a mini-boss. You could make the choice to either fight the boss and keep going, fight the boss and then leave, or put it off until later. In Persona 4, you can technically exit the dungeon with a go-home and pick up right where you left off on that floor later, but there doesn't seem to be any rhyme, reason, or rhythm to it. It always feels abrupt. You're not leaving because this feels like a good place to stop. You're leaving because you are either all out of SP and you're not able or willing to pay the fox for a refill, or because you're just sick of the place and you want to go home. The gimmicks that they try to add to these dungeons also just make it worse in my opinion. For one thing, they only barely exist for one floor in each dungeon. For another, they're just pathetic non-obstacles that amount to nothing anyway. The gimmick in Yukiko's castle is walking towards a door will warp you to another hallway. You have to do the opposite and walk away from them to eventually reach a destination. Okay, that's fine. Then you get to the bathhouse. The gimmick is that there is a door that leads straight to the stairs, but it's locked. By the time you find the key, you're basically already there, so it's only helpful for the one time you might come back for an optional boss. The gimmick of the striptease is that… they turn off the lights? In Void Quest, there's this one really stupid floor where every intersection, you'll be turned into a different direction. Literally, they just take the rotation value of your character and set it to a flat number. Oh, this one's my favorite. In the secret laboratory, the gimmick is that there are two locked doors. You get the first key by making it to the sixth floor, and then you have to backtrack all the way to the fourth floor, on foot, to get the second key. Then you gotta go all the way back down to progress further. Brilliant. You wanna know the hilarious part? One of the late game dungeons, Heaven, is widely considered to be the best dungeon in the game. You wanna know the gimmick of this dungeon? Nothing. It's just randomized floors and a straight climb to the top. 
So that means the best dungeon in the game is the one that's functionally the most like Tartarus. Uh, listen, it's all good to have gimmicks in a dungeon, but if you want to throw a gimmick at us, go all the way with it. If you just want to have randomized dungeons, then just go all the way with it. Don't give me this wishy-washy on the fence stuff is all I'm saying. Furthermore, dungeon crawling takes up a whole last day. Tartarus only takes up your nighttime activity. In Persona 4, you are forced to go to sleep as soon as you come back from the dungeon. This is meant to replace the stamina system from Persona 3, but here's the thing. In Persona 3, you could still do stuff while you were tired. You could still grind your social stats, you could still do your social links, hell, you could even still go dungeon crawling even if it's not a good idea. The only thing you couldn't do while you were tired was study. At night. You could still study at the library. You could even take a nap in class to recover your condition, or go to the nurse's office for a free courage boost with no time consumption. Another thing worth noting is that if you finish the dungeon before the deadline, the plot will not progress until the day after the deadline. If you're like me and finish the dungeons early, then you basically spend weeks waiting for anything else to happen. The net amount of time you spend waiting for the plot is the same as Persona 3, except it'll either be front or back loaded depending on when you finish the dungeon. The dungeon aesthetics are... more varied, I guess, but I wouldn't really say they get better until the end of the game. I know debating over which game handles randomized dungeons better is like arguing over which type of oatmeal is less bland, but I just can't get behind the idea that anything Persona does with its dungeons really makes them more substantial or unhollow. Not in any noteworthy degree, at least. The battle system and party management aspect is mostly the same as the previous game, but you can definitely tell it's been simplified. No, I am not talking about the addition of direct party commands. I mean in terms of other aspects of the game as well. Stuff like splitting your party up to cover more ground is gone. This might not sound like a huge deal, but if the complaint about randomized dungeons is that traversing them is monotonous, then getting rid of the feature that helps make grinding through them easier is not a good move. Even equipping your party feels way too simplified. In a lot of RPGs I like, there was always a trade-off between a piece of equipment's raw stats and its secondary properties. While there is a little bit of that in this game, it was never enough for me to just not pick the weapon or armor with bigger numbers. Unless I was short on cash. The only equipment I really put any thought into was the accessory slot, since those are more varied in terms of their effects. In Persona 3, while characters had fixed skill sets, you had three different physical attributes for your weapons you had to take into account. You had fusion weapons that could change your attack attribute, you had fusion weapons that could boost certain elements, armor had random bonus effects so no two pieces were necessarily the same in addition to the effects of your accessory. I know not everyone's looking for a game with super deep party management, but even just the little bit of thought that Persona 3 and other older RPGs provided would have been appreciated and I'm sure nobody would have had a problem with it. Persona 4, despite adding a few new things, ironically ends up feeling more bare-bones and oversimplified. But by far, the strangest thing about Persona 4's gameplay is the way it handles damage calculations. So first, let me establish something. All-out attacks, as well as any of the collab attacks that the characters can do afterward, are considered almighty damage. Almighty is essentially your non-elemental damage, as the game even describes it as such with Almighty-type battle items. There are enemies in this game that resist Almighty attacks. Think about it. If Almighty is your non-element, and you have enemies that resist non-elemental damage, then you could say that this enemy resists nothing, and you would technically be correct. It gets even weirder though. So, you know how enemies have weaknesses and resistances, right? You strike weaknesses for an extra turn and knock the enemies down for an all-out attack. Well, apparently not. There are enemies that take more damage from certain elements, but do not have the weakness flag set. I will be referring to this as a pseudo-weakness. There are also enemies that take less damage from certain attacks without having the resist flag. A pseudo-resistance, if you will. There are even a few instances of enemies taking single-digit damage from their weakness. 
meaning they have the weakness flag, which gets them knocked down by said attack, but take essentially no damage from it. I'm gonna make up another term here and call this a soft weakness. I know Nocturne and Persona 3 had a few select battles where the numbers are clearly being played with, but it never got this ridiculous. Persona 4 does this way more often, and it's way more arbitrary about it. If I had to guess why they did this, I'm assuming it must have been some kind of balancing measure. I know physical attacks are absurdly powerful in this game, and about half the bosses in this game have a pseudo-resistance to fizz. This is even more strange though, because Persona 4 was literally built off Persona 3, and the damage scaling in that game was fine for the most part. This doesn't ruin the game or anything, but I literally had to use three made-up terms just to explain what's going on here. That's kind of ridiculous. But to be completely honest, I can at least tolerate these things. If you want to know what really drives me up the walls, it's trying to have a discussion about the characters. Now don't worry, when I say the characters, I mainly mean the main cast of characters. I'm actually quite fond of a good chunk of Persona 4's social link characters, and have never taken any issue with any discussion surrounding them. So there you have it. So I guess the first thing I should address here is the whole debate over whether characters should develop over the course of the story, or should that development be exclusively tied to the protagonist's relationship with them. On one hand, needing to write the story in a way where you don't have to complete anyone's social links sounds like a not very fun time. It means that throughout the story the writers are left with no choice but to religiously stick to one or two traits for each character. The character arcs are relegated to one specific part of the game, and even then, it's not really meant to feel complete. It's really just a catalyst for their further development via social link. A lot of the time, in between story events is occupied by those slice of life moments I mentioned earlier, where instead of being used to facilitate some kind of character growth, they just kind of exist to persist the same one note qualities. It's no wonder that this is all you see in the spin offs. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but I feel like the reason why I didn't find stuff like Chie's portrayal in Persona Q too far off is because ya boy already knew what's up. The writers must make the assumption that the player has not done any of the characters' social links and experienced the more fleshed out side of those characters for every game going forward from now on. That's not to say other characters don't get flanderized in the spin-offs, but I feel as though that precedent might not have started if Persona 4 had some type of personal growth for the characters that they could work off of. On the other hand, making the player's intervention integral to the development of your friends might make the player's role feel more important. In conclusion, Chie is a very deep and complex character. This game really makes it a point to have the characters always tell you how much they need you, cherish you, and rely on you. Uh, okay, that's, that's sweet and all, but this in itself may actually raise another problem. The root of the issue is that I think the main cast revolve a little too much around you, the player. The investigation team is supposed to feel like a tight-knit group of friends. Let's eat some ice cream. We are best friends. You, you are, are right. right. Ha 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 ha. Let's eat some ice cream. We are best friends. You, you are, are right. right. Ha 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 ha. And they do most of the time, but they also, a lot of the time, end up feeling like you're yes-men. The kind of neat thing I liked about the other Persona games is that the characters weren't afraid to be a dick to you or call each other out on bullshit but I don't want to go too far into spoiler territory for the other games. Like, I don't think these guys ever disagree with you on anything. The only time your friends ever question you is when you debate over whether to kill a guy or not. But hey, some people on the internet can't stand the thought of someone disagreeing with them, so this game might just be made for them. Even minor things like the AI in battle being worse than Persona 3's, it's one thing that the investigation team isn't as combat smart as a group like C's and are less self-reliant, but the fact that Yosuke straight up encourages you to order everyone directly so that they don't throw a fight just makes it feel canon. Can you tell I don't think very highly of their intelligence? This group has three brain cells, and one of them is the player. 
It just cements the idea that these characters are extremely dependent on you and don't ever feel like they can get any growth on their own. Neither in the story or game. The player has to oversee everything. I've got nothing against direct commands by the way. In fact, I encourage direct command usage in this game specifically. The game clearly expects you to guard basically any sort of charged attack from a boss, and if you don't have both Tarunda on the boss and Rakukaja on your party, it'll almost always be lethal. To my knowledge, there's no way to get your party members to guard unless they're unable to do literally anything else. And of course, I gotta address the elephant in the room. You know what's weird? Discussion around this game about finding and accepting yourself is very unnecessarily divisive. All the stuff I said before is just my personal opinion, and I'm sure most people can let that shit go. What I'm talking about here is a whole different beast. Imagine people getting mad that the game doesn't come to the conclusion that they wanted out of some of these characters, and then either misinterpreting the entire message or assuming that this game must be anti this or anti that. Because the game doesn't outright say that Kanji is gay and he shows attraction towards some women, the game must be homophobic. Naoto does not say that she's trans, therefore the game is transphobic. If you think the narrative would have been better if the writers did go in that direction, that is perfectly fine. Acting like the people behind this game must be terrible people because they didn't is just petty. Saying that the writers are wrong is just absurd because they decide what to do with the characters. They belong to them. Getting hung up on a dated piece of media from 2008 is a waste of time, and we should focus our efforts towards portraying and treating diversity as a normal thing in our current media. Truthfully speaking, I don't even really give a shit about Naoto's gender. I think she's kinda mid either way. The game creates a good setup for a character dealing with discrimination in the crime fighting field, but that subject never comes up again. All of Naoto's interactions with the police thereafter seem pretty normal. Naoto's social link is more about her trying to find enjoyment in investigating again. Okay, what about her peers? There has to be some adversity she has to put up with at school, right? Nope. When the word goes out that the detective prince is actually a girl, both the guys and girls are just kinda like, Naoto's a girl? Hot. And then Naoto wins the beauty pageant, with the reason given being, she won both the male and female vote. Where exactly is the gender struggle here? From my angle, it looks more like gender is a game and Naoto's winning. Naoto is basically just androgynous appeal at this point. So anyways, Naoto is a very deep and complex character. This is Persona 4, a game that gets most of its credit for doing the bare minimum of improvements and introduces its own problems with the changes made. It's like they tried to fix Persona 3 with duct tape and you can clearly see what parts are patched up. Which is ironic coming from a game that people pride in its refinement of the formula set up by Persona 3. Now, I realize they did put this game together only a year after Persona 3 Fest. It's impressive they were able to put together what they did in that amount of time, but I don't think it's nearly enough to discredit Persona 3 or call it a straight upgrade. Also, Persona 2 Eternal Punishment did the same thing, only way better. Many of the things I mentioned in a vacuum probably aren't that bad. It's more like a death by a thousand cuts thing. Only in realizing the sheer totality of it does it really start to eat away at me. I made most of my comparisons to Persona 3, but I'm sure someone out there could point out how it draws from the other games too. Introspection, Overcoming Insecurity, YOLO, Persona 4? More like Persona Fraud? And you can't say that I'm wrong because I have a degree!
One of my favorite things about Persona 4 has got to be the setting. You're immediately introduced to what kind of place Inaba is, the happenings in the town, the overall attitude of the residents there. It's a small town where news and rumors spread fast, making it a perfect setting for this murder mystery. It's a traditional and rustic place that's slowly being taken over by the consumerism of a bigger and more convenient superstore. Every day's great at your tunics. Save money, live better. Walmart. As such, some of the natives of that area aren't too fond of the urban life as it's threatening the way of life they've known for so long. Meanwhile, many of the other citizens will comment on how boring Inaba is. Many of the youths will go over to Okina City to have their fun. At the same time though, just like the countryside in real life, Persona 4 lets you get inventive and find ways to have fun in this little town. In Persona 4 Golden, they dig into this idea even more by allowing you to actually step outside at night. In the original, the only things you could do at night were either warp over to your two night social links or do stuff in your room. Stepping outside under the night sky in Inabo for the first time is a surprisingly pleasant feeling. Everything looks even more peaceful. Gardening for vegetables, making your own box lunches, reading a book or folding envelopes in your room, even fishing at the river are some ways to pass the time. While mundane in concept, the game makes sure that every one of these vanilla activities reap worthwhile rewards. Hoarding vegetables is a good way to get a lot of free resources instead of needing to buy them or farm for their more valuable counterparts in the dungeons. Doing any sort of boring task will net you some sort of material reward or with a boost to your social parameters. While I personally relate a bit more to Persona 3 setting, Inaba is a very good setting for this type of game. The Hashino trilogy of Persona games has always had a focus on cherishing your time and making the best of it no matter what kind of place or situation you're in right now. Finding things to do in a mundane place can be kind of an adventure in itself. I watched a very good video about the anime countryside by Hazel. Uh, she doesn't know I exist, but she perfectly describes the boonies in a way that lines up perfectly with what Persona 4's Inaba seems to be going for. It's boring, non-pejorative. The video is like one hour long and a genuinely good watch. I'll leave a link to that video in the description and cards. Like you people actually look at those things. And then naturally, you have the parts where you and your friends just want to get away for a bit and do something a bit more exciting. A lot of people like to hate on the extra events added in Golden, but I actually enjoy them. Sure, they don't facilitate any plot points like in Persona 3, but they're still entertaining. I will never not laugh at the part where Kanji unknowingly talks to a prostitute. A girl hit on you? What did she say? Something like it only costing so much for an hour. I don't know, what was she talking about? Oh, actually, there is one trip that's used to segue into a big story arc. Honestly, I think the ski trip was done pretty well. As a matter of fact, let's address the whole Marie thing real quick. I don't think Marie is as big of a damper as people say she is. That's not to say I love her, I'm just saying I don't really hate her either. Like, I don't know. Everything about her social link felt pretty inoffensive. Her poetry is cringy, but it's supposed to be. For some people, Marie ruins the game, so they'd rather play the original. Me personally, I can live with her. If I'm not in the mood for it, I'll just ignore her. She kinda just stays in the velvet room all game unless you talk to her, and you can still get the normal Persona 4 ending without her, it's all good. As for her story segment, it's schlocky for sure. The part where Marie says she'll turn into a monster so you should abandon her, and the protagonist comes up with the brilliant idea that we should just defeat the monster without killing her? Kinda sounds like they wrote themselves into a corner with that one. Then you get this lame fake death scene, and oh look, she's alive. Never would've guessed. But there is one thing I actually like about all this. I actually think her dungeon, the Hollow Forest, has an interesting gimmick. While most Persona 4 dungeon gimmicks are just laughably bad and hardly existent, 
The Hollow Forest actually kinda changes the way you approach things. The only items and equipment you have to work with are what's in the dungeon, and everything else goes away until you exit the dungeon. I mentioned earlier how you can farm and hoard resources really easily. In this dungeon, you kinda have to ration the items you get throughout the dungeon. It's also the only place where you can get armor that can resist elements at the cost of any sort of defense. Oh yeah, you also lose half your current SP after every battle. That's kind of insane, although you do get slow SP regenerative accessories to compensate. It never felt too much like a chore, but never too minor like previous dungeons. The gimmick still feels ever-present. Also, the place probably has my favorite aesthetic out of all the dungeons, save for Heaven and Magatsu Inaba. Tangent aside, let's get back to the fuzzy friendship stuff. It's almost kind of a huge stroke of luck you manage to make friends with people in your class so quickly. I think that a lot of us have had the experience of meeting and immediately hitting it off with people. Even I, as someone who normally requires time to warm up to new people, have had at least a couple experiences like that with certain people. It's rare enough to the point where it might feel kind of jarring for me how it happens in this game, but also a weird, satisfying wish-fulfillment kind of thing. I think, to some small extent, we all want this kind of scenario at some point in our lives. And it's not like everyone just accepts you with open arms. As stated earlier, some of the locals are kind of prejudiced towards you city boys. Your teacher immediately starts shitting on you on your first day at school, and your teammates are very cold. In fact, a lot of your social links start off with people being kind of cold towards you. Some running themes you might notice throughout these social links are the character in question trying to avoid their problems without really knowing the true cause of it. Another trend you'll see is family. With the exception of a few outliers, family seems to play some sort of role in a lot of these character struggles. You have obvious examples like with your uncle Dojima and your cousin Nanako. Two different perspectives on a family dealing with the loss of the mother figure. Loneliness and not feeling like they're fit to be family. Great examples for sure, but I want to get into the more underrated social links. I'm not going to painstakingly summarize any of these, I'm just going to spout out whatever I like about them that comes to mind. Shu Nakajima, no not that Nakajima, is one that personally stuck with me. Maybe not in the way that you would think though. So when I was in middle school, I was always lectured about how I should be doing better. At first, I thought it was just because my grades were bad, but looking back at it, it was actually a little more complicated than that. Long story short, you needed an 85 average in all subjects to reach the minimum requirements for honors, but I always got screwed over by at least one subject. Like, no joke, sometimes I would do a little bad, and other times, I could do good in every other subject and end up with an 82 in one of them. And I would still disappoint my mom because that kept me from getting the honor roll. It didn't matter if my grades were bad or good, if I didn't make the honor roll, I knew I would hear the same thing every time when I got home. I even started to think that my value as a person was contingent on my grades at one point. Hell, I knew people who had it way worse than I did. It was straight A's or nothing for them, and they just made me feel like I was in no position to complain. So to see a top student like Shu in a perpetual state of needing to always be number one in fear of ending up going through what I did really resonated with me. Shu even cheated on a test out of fear of being usurped by another kid in his class, but got caught and ended up failing. Then he breaks down crying because his mother said he wasn't her son when she found out. Yo, not gonna lie, that, that kinda hurt a little inside. Thankfully, it ends on a positive note, and the moral of the story is that you are worth more than your grades. You should try to experience other things in life too. And your parents will still love you no matter what. Ideally speaking. If you can't relate to anything I just said, it might be kind of an Asian thing. Naoki Konishi is one of my favorite social links. So basically, one of the victims very early on in the ongoing serial murder case is Naoki's sister, Saki Konishi. 
Naoki now gets nothing but sympathy and special treatment from people because of this. Naoki's family also runs a local liquor store, but as established earlier, Juness has been taking over, so the shopping district kinda hates Juness. To make matters worse, Saki was working at Juness, marking her as a sort of traitor to the shopping district. Yeah, Naoki's got a lot to deal with. Not only is he struggling to deal with the loss of his sister, but it doesn't seem like anyone else will really let him move on either. There are times where you and Naoki will be hanging out and he'll just be trying to live a normal life, and then those pesky gossiping neighbors will lecture him about how he should be standing together with his family in these tough times. Even the liquor store kinda gets special treatment from people, as allegedly more people have been shopping there out of pity for the family. There's a really nice scene where you take Naoki to Juness since he never visited the place where Saki worked. While there, he actually meets Yosuke for the first time. Yosuke had feelings for Saki, and her death is a large part of Yosuke's motivation in pursuing the murder case. It's actually really nice seeing them talk. The way Naoki describes his relationship with his sister kinda reminds me of my older sister when we were little. My sister's still alive, by the way. Just thought I would clear that up. They'd fight over stupid shit like eating each other's snacks, and her excuse would be that they'd expire if she left them there. She'd jump across the rocks in the river and then sneak up behind him and scare him. But then, Naoki has this huge realization when he opens the fridge to eat his cream puffs, only to see that they've expired. Saki is gone. This time, his sister crossed the river, and she isn't coming back. One short little honorable mention I want to throw in there is the nurse, Uehara. This one doesn't really have anything to do with family, but I do think the nurse's social link is a good demonstration of workaholism and rediscovering your drive for your career. I also may or may not be attracted to her. I'm normally pretty harsh when it comes to the lack of character development during the story, as I always felt as though you don't have to entirely relegate it to social links. I view party member social links as a way to develop them more as people who occupy and add a little life to the world, while the story develops them as actual characters with a role in the story. While Persona 4 seems to lack the latter, I think it actually excels with the former. As a result, the characters end up being pretty fun to be around regardless. I think Yosuke has a pretty good social link. His social link is very down to earth and shows that he really is a normal guy dealing with normal problems. Dealing with annoying co-workers at his retail job, or having people talk shit behind his back because his dad runs Juness. Saki was the only one who was nice to him, and given how early in the story it's revealed that she despised him, this just complicates his feelings even more. I personally don't think she completely hated him. I like to think those harsh words he heard were just an exaggerated suppressed thought, not unlike what the character Shadows say about their counterparts. Sure, she probably didn't like him crushing on her, but I do think she probably liked him as a friend. A lot of people write off Yosuke as a dick, and he is sometimes. He may not be the best person, but he's a good friend. Kanji is by far my favorite Persona 4 character. I remember being called unmanly for not being into sports or cars or whatever else there was. Hell, not just that. I was called un-American for not watching sports once. That one just confused me more than anything. What's more, I used to avoid girly stuff like the plague. You wouldn't catch me dead next to Sailor Moon. And now I've actually watched it as an adult, and I think it's pretty cool. Retroactively enjoying media is just a thing that I do. So you know what, Kanji? I salute you. Seeing Kanji bring out a bunch of toys that he made for some kid always puts a smile on my face. I personally wouldn't come to the conclusion that he's gay. He clearly shows attraction to girls throughout the game, with the only exception being Rise, who he outright expresses disinterest in to her face. I think the obvious reason for that is Risei just isn't his type. Speaking of Risei, Risei is a fun gal to be around. I find her persistence when flirting with the protagonist to be fucking hilarious. 
I also find the idea of the celeb falling for the most basic normal guy instead of the other way around a kind of neat twist on the standard trope. Something that Risei and Yukiko have in common is that their social links share a theme of initially wanting to just get away from your old life, whether to seek independence or to just feel like you're in control. It gets way more depressing with Risei, but you get the idea. I think Yukiko is very underappreciated, by the way. I liked creepypastas when I was in high school, so I'd probably enjoy her horror stories. I also laugh at a lot of things that I probably shouldn't. Hell, I might even relate a bit to her social link. Chie is... inoffensive. Her social link didn't really make me think more highly of her or anything. She's really goofy, but in a likable way. I mean, just look how energetic and expressive her battle animations are. You know who else has those qualities? Teddy. Except Teddy's a degenerate. I wish I had more nice things to say about him, but I don't. And I guess Naoto's cool to have around. Actually, Naoto kinda carries the investigation after she joins. The farthest the group got without her was, we know the suspect targets people on TV. Naoto figured out the culprit's method of kidnapping, confirmed Mitsuo wasn't the culprit, and is apparently the only competent one officially investigating the case because the cops sure aren't. A mixed bag for sure. While some of these characters are hard to love, they're harder to hate. The music, on the other hand, is not hard to love at all. Persona 4 was the last Megami Tensei game on the PS2. And the music in this game kind of harkens back to the other games of that time. I'm not a music person, I don't really know anything about music theory or composing, but I guess PS2 Megaro music just has a certain sound to it that's immediately recognizable. I've only played the prologue of Rida 1 so far, but I can already kind of hear the resemblance. It makes sense that a game about a murder mystery would follow some of the same cues as Rido, a game where you work with a detective agency to solve a mystery. When it's not doing that though, this game's music exudes powerful emotions. Whether it be an overdose of joy or espresso depresso hours, I think another nice touch is the change of music with the weather. When it's bright and sunny out, the music is also very bright and sunny. When there's an overcast, the music dials it back a little with a chill tune. When it's raining... And by god, Persona 4 has some of my favorite boss themes in the whole series. Persona 4 is not really a game I play for the story, but there are parts that I do like about it. Shortly after arriving in your new home for the next year, the game sets all the pieces into their place. Almost all of the necessary details for the mystery being set are actually laid out right at the beginning. 
you'll likely be able to pick up the correlation between the serial murders and the Midnight Channel pretty early on. You immediately learn that in this small town, news and rumors spread fast, making it easier to investigate. All the suspects are basically introduced to you right away, hidden in plain sight. As long-winded as the prologue to this game is, it's actually a very strong one. I think the game tackles pretty important themes that are kind of undersold. In fact, this game kind of revisits a lot of past ideas from the previous games. You have the introspective aspect of Persona 1, the facing of one's suppressed darker qualities from 2, and the emphasis on valuing the people and things in your life from 3. However, I think the most interesting thing this game tackles is truth. Persona 4 accurately portrays how easily people will believe what they hear, how eager they can get over just hearsay, or how easily they will stop pursuing the truth once they reach a conclusion they are satisfied with. The theme of rumors and how much influence they have over people is something that was explored in Persona 2 Innocent Sin. But I honestly kind of prefer the way Persona 4 handles it here. Innocent Sin was a little too over the top in my opinion. While here, there's a progression to it all, with people appearing on the news first, and then becoming present in the minds of people, which is reflected on the Midnight Channel. On the other side of the truth coin, there's also finding your true self. If you're familiar with Carl Jung's psychology, or the previous Persona games, the shadow is the darker repressed qualities of ourselves that we really don't want other people seeing. We may be quick to deny those parts of us when we're backed into a corner. We fear that if people see that part of us, they won't be able to disassociate those qualities from us, and possibly see us as only those bad things. People are more than their flaws though, and it's never too late to grow past them. Or maybe we'll never truly rid ourselves of them, but we learn to accept them as part of who we are. Nobody's entirely 100% good and pure. Then there's the persona, the mask we put on in front of others. In actual Jungian psychology, this can change depending on who you're with or the context of the scenario. In the case of modern persona, only the protagonist can change personas to accurately represent this concept. For the other characters, their singular persona more represents the qualities they are more outward about. If you wanted to, you could painstakingly comb through every persona's actual lore and see how you can relate each character to said figure. There are two wolves inside me. The story might be slow, but once it gets good, it gets really good. After Naoto was rescued from the TV world, Naoto was able to describe the culprit's kidnapping methods. We know the culprit rings people's doorbells and then just grabs them and throws them into a TV they must be traveling with. All the while, the protagonist is receiving strange warning letters in the mail. Dojima, being a cop and your guardian, is not okay with you having any involvement with this case, so you keep it under your hat. But when the second one comes in the mail, he was home and you got busted. For your own safety, you're kept in solitary confinement. But little did they know that this would set themselves up for disaster. After leaving Nanako home alone, she's the next to get kidnapped. You deduce the culprit must be able to move around and park in front of people's houses without raising any suspicion. That's right, it's a delivery man. Not just any delivery man, an ex-politician who had an affair with the first victim, Namatame. Initially ruled out due to his solid alibi for the first initial two murders, but got caught red-handed kidnapping your cousin Nanako. The stakes are high now. When you capture Namatame, he is spouting stuff that makes absolutely no sense to you. On top of that, you were convinced that Nanako just died because of this guy, and the police aren't able to make a strong case against him. Everyone's minds are clouded with hatred right now. So then, you are given the option to either take it upon yourself to punish him, or just stand by until the authorities inevitably let him go. Regardless of whether you do the deed or not, the rest of the year passes and you leave a fog-covered Inaba with absolutely no sense of accomplishment. What you're actually supposed to do is a little bit obtuse. 
You basically have to stall out for making an actual decision for as long as possible until you all decide to collect yourselves. Okay, let's slow down here. If what he's saying doesn't line up with what you know, then maybe there's something you don't know. That's when it hits you. Namatame had a solid alibi for the first two incidents. He also does not know anything about the warning letters he received. When asked who the first person he kidnapped was, he points to Yukiko. Namatame knew that people who appeared on the Midnight Channel would die eventually, so he started kidnapping whoever he would see next. Upon discovering he could stick his hand in the TV, he thought he could hide the victims inside to prevent their demise. You saving the victims thrown in and them turning up okay, to him, confirmed his suspicion, so he kept doing it. But then, who threw the first two victims in? It was Adachi. So I just want to go on a little side tangent about Adachi real quick. While the protagonist is a person who garners powers from his bonds, Adachi is supposed to reflect what could happen to a person who goes through life without bonds. In the original game, we literally don't see any of that in Adachi until he goes on his long rant before you battle him. When I first played the original Persona 4, I felt like he was kind of a lame villain. In Persona 4 Golden, however, you gain a much better grasp on him as a person through his newly added social link. Sure, what Adachi did was inexcusable, but he wasn't just a shitty person. He was a normal guy who got good grades, had hobbies and dreams, but ended up with a very unfulfilling life despite working so hard. And then all of a sudden, what he's saying is starting to kind of make sense. Let's be honest, there's nothing great about the real world, is there? It's just dull and annoying as hell. No one accepts that's the way things are. They're just stuck with it because they can't deny it either. Those who actually succeed in life, they just happen to be born with a magic ticket called talent. If you don't have it, you can either accept or deny that fact until you die. That's your only choice. Listen. You might have hopes and dreams right now, but that's only because you know nothing about reality. One day you'll see. You'll be faced with a boring reality that boxes you in, no matter where you go. So coming to the conclusion that there's nothing else for him in life, he made it all a game for himself. If you do Adachi's social link, the protagonist will even consider not exposing him because he considers Adachi a friend. And the game gives you that option resulting in a much better bad ending in my opinion. Personally, I think Adachi only works well as a villain because of Golden. Okay, end of tangent. So after all is said and done, Inaba is now safe, the Midnight Channel stopped showing, and the town is peaceful until the time you're about to leave. But wait, who was giving people the power to enter TVs? The game can very easily deceive you into just going home and ending the game. The ending is even mostly the same as the true ending. You have to actively choose to keep pressing onward and gather enough clues to figure out it was... That gas attendant you met at the beginning of the game, who was actually the goddess, is Anami. She gave you, Adachi, and Namatame the power to enter TVs by shaking your hands. You and Namatame gave everyone else the power to enter the TVs by taking them in, which led to everyone awakening to their personas. She is also the one who started the rumors about the Midnight Channel. Okay, I know that sounds stupid, but hear me out. I genuinely thought this was a good twist. It honestly does kind of feel like one of those schlocky, mindfuck endings you'd find in an old PS2 game. Not gonna lie, I kinda dig it. I also find this whole ending sequence and the final boss as a great reward to the players who sought out the truth until the very end. Izanami states that humans will often just accept the conclusions that they are satisfied with and move on and that's honestly kinda true. You saw how eager the police in Inabo were to shut the murder case whenever they found a suspect. You saw how complacent people began to get when the fog from the TV world started enveloping Inaba. The truth isn't just a hard pill to swallow, sometimes it's hard to even reach the truth. But we should always aspire to accept nothing but the truth in its entirety, 
so we can live our lives without doubt. This is Persona 4, a game that covers themes and ideas both old and new, an encapsulation of everything that came before it. This game is always able to get me to genuinely laugh, while also having some emotionally heavy moments in just the social links alone. A genuinely good compliment to one of my favorite games of all time, during the PS2 era of Megaten consisting of mostly duologies. In fact, Persona 4 marked the end of said era. If you ask me though, I'd say this was a satisfying conclusion. Persona 4 is a really weird game for me to talk about. I know I spent a large portion of this video criticizing it, but I need to make the point clear that I do like this game. Rather, it's just really easy to use Persona 4 as an outlet of frustration towards the overall discussion surrounding these games. A large part of that is because, as I've said before, Persona 4 encompasses a lot of the qualities of the games that came before it, and that seems very intentional. They're all part of the same series after all. At the same time though, this game makes me feel skeptical of how people approach criticism towards any of the Persona games. This can range from, Persona 4 sucks, the older games are better, while Persona 4 literally bases its narrative around introspection and approaches it similarly to how the first two games did, to other insane shit like, WHAT?! WHAT ARE YOU TALKING ABOUT?! when the games are not only intentionally similar to each other, not only likely made for the same audience, but also when the staff literally are fans of Persona 3. Then you've got people ironically ignoring what the game is trying to convey and just coming to conclusions that satisfy them, going completely against the game's own message. On the other hand, I really enjoy this game. I have fond memories of not only playing this game, but also sharing it with others. I've watched my real life friends play this game and have a blast, Hell, I get second-hand enjoyment just from watching them. I guess now I just feel like it's harder to share my enjoyment of these games because of the things I've mentioned earlier. It seems like no matter what angle you take, the discussion will always end in a headache. Sometimes I think to myself, maybe I should just stop. Maybe I should just stop caring about the discussion around anything and just enjoy things privately. But naturally, people want to talk about the things that they like. It's why I make videos. So here I am right now. I guess overall the thing that I wanted to get across the most is that I think people generally lean a little too hard on how the game refines what Persona 3 laid out rather than what the game does well on its own. Especially when the refinement is really rough. For every improvement there's a change that I find really questionable. It's one step forward one step back. Sometimes it feels like a good representation of the series as a whole. Other times, it feels more like a parody of it. Persona 4 has a genuinely good message behind it, looking inward and learning to become comfortable with who you are. It's just not a message I really needed to hear at the time when I first played it. I was already well on my way to finding people who accepted me for who I was at the time. But I know a lot of people who did play this game just at the right time, and that's why they look back at it so fondly. I can easily see this game being a lot of people's favorite. I'm friends with people who consider Persona 4 their favorite. As for me, if I had to sum up this whole video in one sentence, I'd say... Persona 4 is hard to love, but it's harder to hate. 